More than half of high-growth companies struggle with the sales development process. If you want your sales team to have more at-bats with decision makers at target accounts, talk to Inside Sales Team, the sales development team experts at InsideSalesTeam.com. Hello, 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 everybody. This is David Delaney with another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. I am truly honored to get the next guest on the show. This is someone I've been trying to get on the show for months. He's very hard to uh, get a hold of as he's a very busy guy. Mr. Kevin Dorsey with Snack Nation. How are you doing today, Kevin? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right, David. You know, I didn't realize I was so hard to get in touch with, but I guess that's a good thing, right? <laughs> I can tell that you're a busy guy, man. I mean, you're uh, you're one of those uh, running, you know, uh, running uh, probably here and there all day and, and trying to stay ahead of things. So I just appreciate you breaking off an hour, especially toward the end of the month. So. Absolutely, man. Looking forward. I've been listening to the podcast for a long time. I have a very special place in my heart for the SDR world. So, you know, I've, I've been listening for a while. So it's fun to actually be on the, the show this time. Yeah, I mean, you, we definitely um, we've got some momentum. Um, we're, we're getting close to 30 episodes. And uh, by the time folks hear this, uh, we'll be pretty close to that that number. So, again, really appreciate you coming on the show I, I want to dig into your background. I think it's really, really interesting. And especially one of the things I read on your LinkedIn page was a quote by uh, Jim Rohn, who's one of my favorite mentors and, and philosophers. And it says, formal education will make you a living. Self-education will make you a fortune, which is one of my favorite quotes by Jim Rohn. So I want to talk about your background, dig in on that so the listeners can get to know you a little bit, and then let's talk about your philosophy also. Sounds good. So I guess just my sales background to start? Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess in line with that quote, I, I chose to get into sales about it's called 15 years ago, even while I was still in college. Like Everyone asked me how I went from kinesiology to sales. And I just tell them like, well, I, I chose to because I thought sales was the most secure job you could possibly have. If you knew how to sell, you would always have a job. So I just started getting into it. So I started reading, you know, the, the Zig Ziglar's, the Brian Tracy's, started selling door to door, doing some of like, I just did multi-level marketing. I did some insurance sales, going door to door, cold calling, you know, the whole work. And then I would sneak into conferences to try to learn how to sell. You know, because when it comes to multi-level marketing, they always have like that extra conference you can pay for to go to. So I would sneak in so I could learn like how they did it and what they did. And I've really never looked back from there. So I sold all through college and then moved back to L.A., ran some personal training studios for a while where I was doing all of the membership sales and running the studios. So took one little studio and grew it out to three fully running studios. Then got into fitness equipment sales from there, then found human and then helped create Snack Nation. So it's been quite the ride. Okay. Th this is really interesting. Kin kinesthesiology. <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm murdering that word, but what, sure. what is that? And, and, you know, why, what, tell me about that. I mean, what, what is that? What does that make? Sure. So kinesiology is the study of human movement. And oh, so I, I had, that, man. I'm sorry. It's no, all good. It's all, it's all right. It's, it's, you know, say it again, it's, say it again. <laughs> kinesiology. Gotcha. Okay. And so, and so it was, you know, I thought I wanted to get into physical therapy and then realized that actually most physical therapists are working with, you know, senior citizens and accident rehabilitation, where in my head, I'd always visioned like sports rehabilitation. So that's where I was like, well, all right, that is what it is. But the blessing of that, even though at the time I hated it was kinesiology was an education major which required me to take quite a few psychology courses. And I love psychology. I'm an absolute brain nerd because I think it's just such an interesting piece of us. So because I started getting into psychology then is also what I think helped me get into sales long term because so much of sales is psychology. Completely, man. I mean, there's such a huge connection right there. And, and so there's a few themes here. I mean, one is that you you were studying that and and that that was what your passion was and then also you were like if i learn how to sell i can always you know make make a living it's it's job security so tell right. tell me about that process what made you come to that conclusion i mean i guess the just the opposite of security was insecurity at the time you know the market wasn't that great 
I, uh, you know, the everyone's talking about like, will you have a job? How do you get a job? If you look at job postings, there's always sales positions available. And then you also then have the draw of, well, you can make a lot of money doing it and you can control it. And so I was like, well, that's, those are some pretty good things to have within a job. And so I was, I was not very good at first. Not a lot of people know this about me. I'm more of an introvert than I am an extrovert. Like, cold calling and knocking on doors was not something I enjoyed doing, but I studied on how to get really good at it. And something that I talk to my SDRs about all the time is there's, there's not much that feels better than being really good at something. When you're really good at it, things are naturally more fun than if you suck at it. So that's, that's one way to make something better is just get better at it. And that was kind of the attitude I took towards selling. Totally, man. And, and you know, what's interesting is, I see sort of a pattern also in your background of you, you got into the training and then you combine that with selling and you built up that, that business to expand to more studios. And then you got into the human, the human business and, and then built up, up snack nation. There's sort of a thread in your background of like health and training and education and psychology kind of bringing all that together. Is that correct? It is. But a lot of people ask me, you know, like, oh, like you really like being like in the health and wellness world or like that I'm passionate about the product. It's really just been kind of like happenstance. And I don't want to call it like random, but I'm not a big product believer like that, you know, and you hear this in sales interviews all the time, right? You have to be passionate about the product. I actually disagree with that. I don't think you have to be passionate about the product. You have to be passionate about selling. I enjoy selling. And as long as what I'm selling doesn't go against my core values, but I couldn't go out and sell cigarettes or I couldn't go sell like antidepressants. Like those are things that just go against who I am. But other than that, I enjoy the sales process. And so that's what I coach a lot of people on is like, do you got to love the, the sale? You got to love that process, the product. You can do it because if you if you're only passionate about the product, if you can only sell something you're passionate about, you're going to be forced to job hop every two to three years because after three years, that product is going to bore the hell out of you. Whereas, dude, this, that, okay, this is really interesting. So, sorry, go ahead. Right, and so whereas if you if you look at the best, like the truly the best, most successful salespeople out there, they sell the same thing forever, forever. Because they're passionate about that process, not about that product. I'm a, I, I'm a, I disagree with the passionate product thing big time. That is so interesting because I was actually just talking to somebody about this. And um, we, were ta we were kind of agreeing with each other on the opposite end of that. And it's, okay. it's almost going back to a lot of the folks who listen to this are SDRs or mm -hmm. SDR managers. And they're newer to their career. And what we were talking about is, hey, if you're in the interview process and you don't understand what the product is and you don't understand who the buyers are and you don't understand their pain points and you don't really care about that, then you should probably go look for something else because you're going to have to spend like 40, 50 hours a week, you know, trying to get inside the head of the buyers and the people that you talk to. And after a while, that's, you're going to, that. You know, if you're not into it, you might get burned out. But what you're saying is that's not as important. It's actually, you know, the being passionate about the sales process and being an excellent salesperson versus the product itself. Yeah, because if you're an excellent salesperson, you'll do all those things. You follow me? But if you need the product to drive your want to get to know your customer, like you, you're already going the wrong direction. And especially, especially for younger people coming up, like you don't, you don't really know, like they, they don't know. And this is not a knock to young people at all, but go out and ask a 23 year old, 24 year old, like what product are you passionate about? And then go find a successful sales job selling it. I like, that's not, out there for everybody. Whereas if you are passionate about becoming an absolute sales ninja, you'll get to know your customer. You'll get to know the problem that it solves because that's what a great salesperson does. The product shouldn't drive that. You should drive that, right? Shoot, you have this podcast. 
like you you made the decision to do this because you're passionate about this these things not because you wanted to be a podcast person oh. right <laughs> yes exactly yeah dude that's a really good point so it's more of uh you know the process of having the interviews with interesting people like yourself uh, learning new things, being able to network, all those things. I don't really care about the actual technical aspects of podcasting. I mean, I I, I had to learn those because I, I put the show out, but it's more, you know, actually getting to know people and creating something valuable for the audience, right? There you go. Yes. Okay. So so that that is really interesting because the the other thing that we talk about sometimes on the show is you know, we, we ask these people who are very new to their career, you know, and are coming into the marketplace to, to become SDRs. We, you know, we ask them to get inside the head of someone in their target market who might have like 10, 20 years experience in whatever it is, you know, IT something. And so they're calling on these people with 10, 20 years experience. And we're asking that this very junior person to have an interesting conversation with them. And, you know, what, I think we're kind of setting them up for failure in some ways because uh, we, we don't spend enough time training and coaching them to really get inside the head of those, those more experienced people that they're calling on. And they end up sending bad messaging and get flamed on LinkedIn, you know, <laughs> like mm-hmm. all that yep. stuff that's happening right now. And so, you know, I guess the question would be like, what what's your feeling about that? Because maybe as you're hiring all these SDRs and these salespeople, maybe they they it wasn't their passion necessarily to get into Snack Nation's product, but you got to get them up to speed so that they can get on the phone and sell it, right? How do you yeah. set that up for them? So we do we do a few things. I actually wrote an article on this called "The Sales Industry Is Backwards," Part Two: The SDR basically saying all that word for word in terms of the, I don't, you can't, you can't teach an SDR to truly speak at an educated level with someone who has 20 years experience in an industry. You, you can't actually teach that. I, I can't remember who I was talking to. I was on a, a different interview process or a different podcast a while back. And I said, if SDRs out there truly understood what my day and my life and my world was like, they would change their approach completely. They, they, they would have to. You, there's nothing that a 23-year-old SDR can hop on the phone and talk to me about at an educated level. It's just, there, there isn't. There's too much that goes into it. But what you have to do, and this is what we do here, this is what I encourage companies that I consult with to do, the best way to prepare an SDR to have conversations with someone that is at a high level, 10, 15, 20 years, is you need to be presenting them information you learned about their company specifically. I think most companies need a much stronger bottoms up approach than a top down approach. This This happened a couple months ago. This SDR has been trying to get in touch with me forever, right? And eventually actually did something kind of sneaky and called one of my sales reps, right? Calls one of my sales reps and says, hey, you know, can I talk to Kevin? Sales rep comes over. He's like, hey, do you know this person? I'm like, I-, I know who they are. No, I'm not going to talk to them right now. So then they emailed me and said, you know, something along the lines, like I talked to one of your reps and I responded back. I was like, let me give you some advice on how that could have gone. You had one of my reps on the phone. You could have asked them what we were using to solve this problem. You could have asked them if this is a problem at all. You could have asked them how it affects their day to day. So then when you get in touch with me, you can say, hey, I spoke to Austin. He told me your dialer is having issues and this is what you need to do to fix it. Can we set up five minutes to talk? Now you're talking my language. Does that make sense? Oh, totally, man. Because because the I think the the go to uh, you know outreach strategy is, hey, Kevin, I have a product. It does this and that. We're working with all these companies. Will you take a call? And it, it's just it just becomes noise to someone like yourself who's getting a hundred of those every day. Yeah. So we do like, you know, we have our playbook here. We do full buyer personas training. I recommend this to everybody. Jill Conrath has a great tool called the buyer's matrix. Great tool. Every single rep that I ever hire, 
has to complete the buyer's matrix for like our top four personas before they're ever allowed to get on a phone. And it is asking questions like, how is their success judged? What does their day look like? What are their pains? What are their successes? What, how do they judge success? Like all of those questions you have to fill out for somebody. And so we do that for all of our personas very, very early on in the process. So like you do need to know your buyer, you need to know what their problems are. But even then when you, (laughs) it's just so funny to me, there's a difference between a persona and a person. And I think we forget that in sales. (laughs) Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like, Okay. okay. It's a, yeah, it's a VP of sales persona, but damn it. I'm a person. I am a singular person that has very personal problems and very personal needs. And if you approach me as a persona, you're going to miss out on all of that. (laughs) That's funny because, you know, we we talk about personas all day, but I I bet a lot of of people, you know, persona is new. I mean, even to think about a persona and and fill out the that matrix, that buyer's matrix, Jill Conrad, that's awesome, man. I'm going to dig that up and start using it myself right after the call. And, you know, so, so yeah, great point. I mean, people are not like VP of sales, 20 years experience, works at an IT company. It's actually Jason, you know, who, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. has, has specific issues that he's trying to deal with. The, the other thing I, I want to ask you about real quick is you said, you know, one way that that SDR in that example could have affected you and, and approached you in a better way is by the best way of, you know, trying to present information about the company. And then you had some sample questions that they could have asked your sales rep. Can you go into that again? Because I think that's a really interesting point. Like what should they have done? So instead of being sneaky and trying to, you know, go around you and stuff. It's more and more getting in touch with people like me cold is I mean, it's damn near impossible. It's not impossible, but it's very, very hard to do. The people that salespeople can get in touch with the easiest are generally the end users. The people actually would have their problem solved by the product. So Snag Nation, for example, we deal a lot with the office managers, HRs, operations, because they're the ones that actually deal with the product day to day. So we sell them first and then sell up to the next level of individuals. If it is an email tool, talk to people in marketing, talk to the people there before you go after the CMO. If it's IT, talk to the engineers, talk to the developers. Like Those people are actually easy to get in touch with, and an SDR can have a better conversation with them because they're not trying to sell them. All they're doing is asking questions. Hey, do you even have this problem? Right, Because if the end user doesn't have a problem, the C-level person, the VP person isn't ever going to sign up for it. Does that make sense? So it's like you find out the problems that are already there from the people that would be affected by your product. Now you can have an educated conversation with me because, I mean, how many, I don't know. I'll see what happens after this podcast. I wonder how many quick question emails I have in my inbox right now (laughs) versus if there was an email in there that said, I know this sucks. Would I open that email? (laughs) Yes, because it actually does suck. And then the first sentence of that line is, I spoke with two of your reps, and it sounds like they're spending more than 30 minutes per day dealing with this. I think our solution might be able to cut that in half. You got five, 10 minutes to chat? Done. Like, no social proof. No, this is who we work with. No, blah, 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 blah. You're solving a problem that you learned about my company. That's the best way to go about it. Okay, I love that. And what uh, approach would you take with having these conversations? Because there, there's a couple of things that I'm thinking. One is, you know, how do you approach the lower level people to start this information gathering? And and then the next question is, you know, the people who run sales development programs are usually the qualification of the meetings that they want the SDRs to set is you know, director level and they have a pain point and they're ready to buy something, you know, there's, there's <laughs> like all this laundry list. So, so one is how do, how would you suggest approaching the lower level folks to start that information gathering process? Quick question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because there, 
I was just I was just talking about this um with Scott Lease the the especially the sales automation marketing automation industry has absolutely killed itself because everyone is doing the same thing to everybody right every VP of anything in the SaaS world is getting hit with quick questions point me in the right direction all that you know who's not getting those emails sales reps coordinators office you know what I'm saying like yeah. so those tactics actually work still at a lower level because they haven't been getting blasted by them. Right. But when you do it as a conversation, so like I was just talking with a company the other day, giving them a little like advice on how to do this. And if you emailed I'm trying to think of like a, like their, so like their product, right. They're helping people like organize kind of like the back office stuff. If you emailed the receptionist and said, Hey, quick question, how are you guys entering information into QuickBooks? Is it manual or do you have an automated process? It's one question. But that one question is going to let you know if your product can even solve something. The response rates on those types of emails are very high because you're not asking for time yet. You're not asking truly invasive questions. It's just like a curious like, hey, do you guys, how do you guys handle this? You get that response back. Now you're engaged. Now you can go and you can create that problem to present to that like leader later. Yes. Okay. So you're, you're on a fact-finding mission. And, and you're, you're trying to get all this information and, and, you know, the folks who you're reaching out to might be more responsive than the higher level people who are becoming immune to these tactics. So you're, you're gathering this information, you're finding these pain points, and now, now it's time to uh, take all this and approach the higher level person so that you could try to set an appointment. Correct. You, know, you went through an example. Give me an example of what that would be. Like to actually get the appointment? Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, it's kind of what I was mentioning earlier. Like you, whether you can cold call them or email them, wherever that starts, we do both. I think you have to do both. But it's presenting what you've learned and going from there. So the S, something to remember too, and SDRs will hopefully appreciate this. AEs will probably disagree, but that's perfectly fine, is the SDR's job is not to create interest. It's to create curiosity. That's it. That's their job. Create curiosity. It's the AE's job to create interest. So you get in touch with me. You say, hey, I know you're suffering with this problem right now. And I think I have a way to do blank. Reduce X, increase X, do X. Do you have five, 10 minutes for a quick chat to see if it's even worth looking into? Now you've piqued my curiosity. I'm going to show up to that initial discovery call at a much higher rate than you just asking for a full demo yet because you've also shown me you know something about my company that honestly i may not even know about which people forget like if you have a product that the vp or the c person doesn't personally use doesn't personally use i probably don't even know if the problem exists so by talking to someone else on the team and finding out what those problems are and then presenting that to me those calls become a lot easier to do because the, now the VP, all they can do is either refute the problem saying, no, we don't have that problem, which they can't do because why? Right. <laughs> that we, we know that they do. Okay. We already <laughs> know that they do. So now what you're doing is they actually have to truly say, I'm not going to solve that problem for my team. Right. And then it just becomes a prioritization thing. But right. It's just not, yeah. it's not yeah. big enough for them at that yeah. point, but at least right. it's a hell of a lot better than quick question. I'm going to ignore you, delete your email because you're not yeah. offering me value. Yeah. I didn't realize people are still doing this. I still get, we're going to close your file emails. Like, <laughs> cool. Close my file. <laughs> like, Okay. Like that just, that boggles my mind that people are still sending those out. That is really fun. Dude, what is this, like 2004? Mm -hmm. I mean, right. and, and what do they have, a file on you, man? Right. It sounds like, like the FBI or something. Right. Jeez. What the hell is this file? <laughs> and um, yeah, quick tip of advice for you. A takeaway sale only works on someone who wants something. If I don't want, <laughs> if I don't want it, please take it away. Like, sorry, <laughs> little rant there. Little no, rant. you're going to close my file? That's cool. great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> finally. I've been waiting for this day. <laughs> No, this is so interesting though. One thing I circled is creating curiosity mm -hmm. because I know, uh, I think it's in Trish Bertuzzi's book. She has like a matrix 
up of the different things that different people are supposed to be doing on the team. So I, and, and S SDR, one of the things is you want to break through that noise uh, mm -hmm. to get the attention and then create the curiosity. And then the next step is creating interest, you know, based on the curiosity, but you got to have the curiosity to set the meeting, right? Absolutely. And yeah. also to no one, this, you got to remember curiosity is a lower form of interest. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive. Nobody shows up to a call if there is zero interest. Nobody. Why, why would I show up to a 15 minute call if there was zero interest in what was going on? But this circles back to what we were talking about earlier. If the call is about potentially solving a problem you know I have versus if the call is for me to learn about your product, screw your product. I don't care. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't care. I coach my SDRs on this all the time. It's like, the call with the AE has to be about learning more on how to solve a problem they discovered, not just about our product. Right, right. Because, I mean, no matter how great your product is, nobody's sitting there going, oh, gee, I hope somebody calls me and talk about their product. I mean, people right. are trying to solve their critical business issues that they're trying to solve every day. But if you if you just present it like, hey, buy my product, I mean, it, you know, it's just it's such a turnoff. Because we, what we coach a lot on here and I coach other people on too is like we call them gap creating questions. And so like, you know, creating pain or creating like need, whatever. I don't like pain selling because it doesn't feel good to anybody, but like gap selling, whereas like you create a gap, but also you're actually selling through your questions because you wouldn't ask the question if you didn't have a solution for it. That's the beauty of like some of these gap creating questions. Like for us, a good gap creating question for us is, so like how often are you mixing up your snacks right now? We wouldn't ask that question if we didn't have a way to mix up people's snacks, right? So um, like I'll use, I'll use exec vision for example. Like I, I love Steve. I listened to his episode on your podcast as well. You know, it's like, hey, like, so how are you, you know, digitally scoring all your calls right now? That question alone, right, is going to show, well, I mean, we, we don't. And what they're expecting the salesperson to do right then is start to sell, right? Say, oh, well, we do blah, 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 blah. If you just move to the next question of like, okay, so then, I mean, how are you, how are you making sure that reps are getting better on their calls? Well, I guess we really, you see where this is going? Right. We're, 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 this is building that curiosity. And so then when you ask for the meeting, you're saying, well, you know, I think this might make sense. I mean, you're, you're doing this, but it sounds like you're not quite able to do blank and blank. I mean, could we shut up a quick five, 10 minute call to walk you through how we might be able to do blank, blank and blank with you? How's tomorrow look? Right. There you go. Inside Sales Team fully integrates with clients. CEO of Discover Org, Henry Shutt, partnered with us, and we've generated over $25 million in new business revenue. They are firing on every best practice for running a sales development team. Learn more at InsideSalesTeam.com. Yeah, but you have to be able to create that gap or else they're not going to – there's no point. There's no point yeah. in moving forward. Yeah. And it's amazing because, uh, you know, when I – first entered the workforce, I worked for a sales training company and, and all we would, we, you know, we had this, we were selling sales training. So we had to take the sales training <laughs> over and over again. And, uh, it, it seems like sales training has kind of fallen by the wayside almost in a lot of companies, you know, it doesn't seem like you hear about many of the sales training companies anymore. And yeah. so I'm just, kind of curious like how how would somebody learn stuff like this if they didn't have kevin dorsey as their vp <laughs> and nobody's doing yeah. sales training anymore it's, it seems nuts well it it is but this was something that i think i mean it was just a big difference for me you asked me about like my journey like so much of it was self-education you know mm -hmm. there are there are books out there like if you're an sdr and you're actually serious about sales and growing and making a lot of money and having a lot of fun, you, you should be reading from the experts every single day. Why wait 20 years to get good at something if you can read it in a weekend from someone who has 20 years of experience? You know, so that you don't, you don't have to be 
coached. Obviously, it helps. It helps a lot. You have a good trainer, a good coach, a good program, significantly better. We do tons of training here at Snag Nation. We go through books together. We do weekly role plays, call reviews, call scoring. I mean, we do a lot here. But one of our themes for 2017 was ownership and owning your own development. What happens if we stopped? If the only reason you're role playing is because I told you to, you don't actually want to be great at what you do. It's plain and simple. So it's starting with the self-education. Go out and read Snap Selling, The Science of Selling, Sales EQ, Fanatical Prospecting, Sales Development Playbook, New Sales Simplified. You know, I mean, I could go on and on and on with like people that are giving this information away for 10 bucks. Go read it. Actually read it. You know, it's one of my interview questions and you know, oh, I really want to get into sales. Cool. So like, what have you done to get yourself ready for sales? Oh, uh, crickets. Right. Like why? <laughs> right. And so then you know, actually, if, they, if they say anything, then you hire them, right? Because, you know, if they've read yeah. any of those books that you mentioned, it's like, okay. Yeah. If someone comes into the interview and it is so funny, man, I have an article on my LinkedIn called how to crush a sales interview. <laughs> it is, it is on my LinkedIn. And in there, I say, you should read some of these things. How many people do you think coming in have read one, that article? I wrote the damn article. Like you're interviewing with me. There's, you should know <laughs> what to do in that interview. If they come in and they've read that and they've already read a, like one of those books, not only do I almost always hire them unless there's like other red flags, they also always succeed here. Always. Hands down, 100% success rate. Bringing it back to the quote, man, formal education will make you a living. Self-education will make you a fortune. And mm -hmm. Jim Rohn, if you have anybody who's listening, if you haven't read everything and listened to everything by Jim Rohn, I mean, he's a godfather of, mm -hmm. of this, this mentality. He's a great guy. And, and you, you, you um, uh, reminded me of a, another Trish Bertuzzi, two questions that she always has in the back of her mind at interviews. What do you know about me and what do you know about my company? And, mm -hmm. and that literally anybody who's listening to this, if you're going in for an interview, you got to just be able to nail at least those two things. Read Kevin's blog. Like, mm -hmm. understand what's important to Kevin. Like, Google him. Like, find out some stuff, right? Uh, and, and understand what Snack Nation does and how they make money and who they talk to and things like that. You will be, like, miles ahead of 90% of the people that come yeah. in. Is that true? Yeah. Or oh, am I it's... being too harsh? No, it, it is true, but for a whole other reason is one of the qualities I look for in SDRs is curiosity. So it's not, it's not just that you did it, it's that you were curious enough to learn it. I had mm -hmm. someone I interviewed with a couple weeks ago, I asked them that question, like, hey, like I'm, I'm a tough interview, believe it or not. I know that's shocking, um, <laughs> but, you know, hey, like, so what, what did you learn about me? Oh, you know, like, you know, you've been here for a while and blah, 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 blah. I was like, did you read any of like the articles on my LinkedIn? Uh, no, no, I didn't. Why not? <laughs> well, I'll ask people. I will ask people straight up because not only am I about to learn about your resiliency, how well you can yeah. deal with tough, tough conversations, but I also want to get an idea into your mindset. Either you're going to make an excuse. Oh, I, I didn't have time. Goodbye. Or you're going to own it. I, and you better own it. Honestly, I just didn't do it. And I realize now that was a mistake. Yeah. Okay. At least you owned it. But that curiosity and someone else said, oh, well, I didn't know I was interviewing with you. Did you ask? You, you showed up to an interview and you didn't know who it was with. Did you ask who you were interviewing with? Oh, no, no, I didn't. Why not? Right. Like, like I've tried to like, I, if you're going to interview with me, Either you're going to get hired or I'm hopefully going to give you some life lessons to go to your next spot that you don't make those mistakes again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's interesting. There's a lot of things. One is, you know, for an SDR or anybody who wants to get into sales, I mean, you've got to have that resiliency and curiosity and, and you know, be tough, thick skinned, you know, and, mm -hmm. and be able to stand up to, to, you know, some tough questions. You have to, you know, so it's, so, you know, that, that approach you know, it's necessary for interviewing people. And the, the, on the other hand, it's like, you know, who's teaching this stuff? Like, how do they, the, because 
for example, I'm, I'm working with a cybersecurity company and I, and I interview a lot of SDRs that come in and it's just, there's just an atrocious lack of knowledge about like who I am and who the company is and what they do and cybersecurity in general. And they just, they just don't have a clue. And it's mm-hmm. like, are, what's going on here? I mean, do they not know that you're supposed to do this? I mean, it, how come nobody's teaching this stuff? Well, it's, I mean, that's something that is unfortunately true as well. I, I, I wrote on this too, that no one's teaching it. Like no one's teaching it. Dude, you need to write and, a book, man. Man, I you don't have enough here for a book. <laughs> I don't have time. Like I, like I, people like Kevin, you need to write more. I'm like, dude, like I got, I got a team of 55 people out there. Like Jesus. we got shit to do. I don't have time to, to write all these influencer articles. So, <laughs> you know, but no one's, no yeah. one's teaching it. And that's yeah. the problem. I had a, and so I was talking with, I had a little consulting call with a company about a month ago. They're trying to build their SDR team out and, you know, looking at like, you know, pitfalls and things to avoid. And a lot of times people, you know, like millennials get this bad rap about being entitled, right? Which I actually, there's some of it there, but what I think is one of the bigger issues is they expect to be taught how to do everything. They, they, they've, been, they've been taught their whole life. Everything they have done, they've been taught how to do. They learned it from a video. Someone taught them to do it, go get grades. Like They need to be taught how, and that involves things that we don't always think about. They need to be taught how to be a professional. They need to be taught how to manage their time. They need to be taught how to communicate with people. Otherwise, it just doesn't happen. And so unfortunately, like no one's teaching them how to do this. And sales is the only industry that's responsible for teaching its own people and it it just blows my mind right like i couldn't go be a doctor tomorrow and get paid to learn <laughs> couldn't i couldn't be a lawyer i couldn't even get an i couldn't like well maybe it's a bad example but i probably couldn't go get an entry level marketing position tomorrow because i don't have any experience and i don't have a degree in it right but i or have sales. to hire a sales person yeah. that majored in marketing and now wants to get into sales like it's just it's totally backwards and they 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 need help and i do wonder too especially when it comes to curiosity is because nowadays information is so accessible that people aren't naturally curious anymore because you can learn mm-hmm. everything so fast and like you 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 i'm seeing that trend and that decline 3 4 years ago people had researched me very well very well hmm. now it's like oh i can i can learn that tomorrow so i don't i'm not that curious right it's just it is what it is yeah yeah and i i think um one last little nag on that is um the art of conversation and just mm-hmm. interacting with people is diminishing you know just the 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 usual culprits of the the phone and and you know being on the computer all the time mm-hmm. um but I, you know, to, to bring it back to a, on a positive level, I mean, I, I think that, you know, if you're listening to this, then you're trying to be curious and you're trying to right. educate. And, um, and the main thing is it goes back to your quote on, on your, um, your Jim Rohn quote. I mean, mm-hmm. self-education is where it's at, man. And, and the, the resources are out there to become excellent at the art of communication, to become excellent at, at, at being an SDR, to become an awesome manager. I mean, everything's out there, but you got to go out and get it and find that information and use it. And I think that's what, that's what Kevin's looking for in people that come in and interview. You know what I mean? So. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So, Matt, what's next for you? I mean, you've got 55 people. You guys are just totally crushing it at Snack Nation. I mean, what's what's your back of the year plan and, you know, what do you have coming up? Man, I, I still have this vision in my head of this perfect sales team, of this perfect sales team where – Wow. And I that. know – right. And I know it's, it's, a, it's a pipe dream. But it's what it's what I strive for, like this perfect sales team where the effort is always there. The reps are self-educating and driving those conversations that, you know, the communication, we can challenge each other and then come up with solutions. Like I just have I have this picture of what a sales team can be, what it can be. And every single day I'm trying to take a step closer to that. 
Will I ever have this absolutely perfect sales team? I don't know, but I'm sure as hell going to keep going for it. So that that's the future, right? Like we're going to keep growing here. Like we're, we're going to continue to scale. We'll probably be at about 70 reps by the end of this year. We're going to be probably over a hundred by the end of next year, but like it's striving towards that, that perfection of the process where man, that team just cranks, right? You get into just like now as a manager, a leader, a director, a VP, you're not corralling, right? You're just coaching. You're not pushing people. You're just pulling people along, right? Getting them to that, that next level. Like, so that, that's the future for me. And I'm going to keep going for it. I'm going to keep striving for it. And we'll, we'll see what happens. Nice, dude. I think, I think you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. I mean, I, I think people rush through the whole vision piece, you know, and the, the culture mm-hmm. piece. They're just like, ah, we'll, we'll just deal with that later. But really, that's where it all starts, right? The vision that you have for your team and, and how it's going to shape up and the culture that you want to create, you, you're starting in the right place with that foundation, right? And now you can mm-hmm. build, everything builds off of that vision that you have. Yes. Awesome. Well, Kevin, this has been amazing. You know, I just appreciate so much your time today and sharing all this insight with us. It's been a great show and, um, you know, we can't wait to see your progress moving forward. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, David. All right, man.